I'm Catherine Arndt, the Chief of the VLGA Connect Studio. Welcome to today's episode, brought to you by the VLGA, your councillor support network and the national broadcaster on all things local government. Hello everyone, it's TGU time from VLGA Connect. Great to have you with us wherever you're watching or listening from. A regular panel discussion sponsored by Hunt and Hunt Lawyers and coming up Today, we're going to see if we can unpack a bit of what's happening as early vote counts come through for the Victorian Council elections. We'll talk about why it's been so difficult to get a read on what's happening and what the VEC says about that. There's some potential strike action coming up at Greater Geelong. A Stonington CEO has responded again to a government planning decision that has just uh, come out. Um, What's happening with the mayor of Townsville? We'd all like to know that, but a new premier there is uh, taking advice on that. And I got a little bit of feedback from our last episode. So let's get into probably mostly today about the council elections. And of course, Reese Thomas coming up a little later on those new regulations. Tony Rownick is at Hunt and Hunt Lawyers. Hello, Tony. How are you? I'm 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 good, Chris. I suspect you and I and probably Julie have been doing a, a this um um chasing uh what's happening in uh in the various ballots across yes, uh, Victoria and seeing what information we can glean and um and uh, uh you know maybe getting a, a bit of an inside knowledge into who might be elected um we, we'll probably have to we'll, we'll have some hints to come but we'll probably have to wait a week or so to really know final results in most councils i would yes think. i think uh, not before next yeah. wednesday is what i'm hearing julie reed is with us from julie a reed and associates i know you're in the city you look like you're parked there at the door julie ready to make a quick getaway <laughs> if you need to the exit sign right behind you <laughs> yeah that's right no 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 i'm in a little booth in the city and uh ready to go this morning um and yeah look it's been an interesting time hasn't it following these elections but anyway look i know we've got lots to talk about in that space so uh let's get on with it chris well well, let's look at a few things that are sort of jumping out from what we do know but firstly i want to deal with the issue of why is it so hard to get a read on what's happening well it's because the vec they declared this some time ago would not be publishing progressive reports they say it's misleading can be misconstrued and that we need to wait for them to complete uh, all of the groups of postal ballots. Of course, they're still coming in as we uh, record this. But, of course, what happens when you leave a void? People will uh, attempt to fill that void. And full credit to the Six News organisation, which has published a response that they've received from the VEC, in which they've actually acknowledged that what's happening this week is not meeting community expectations. And they've said they're actively addressing, as part of future development work, how in future elections they can provide the same level of results reporting as they do for state elections. So what's been happening, Tony and Julie, is scrutineers have been uh, providing their insights to various right. people, social media channels, uh, channels to the media outlets. And what we've been needing to do, because people want to know how's this all shaping up, is cobble together all of those different reports from newspapers, websites, etc., to get a bit of a read on what's happening and quite frankly tony it's been exhausting this week oh it's it's, <laughs> it is a lot of work and it is newsworthy not just because you know we we all want to know who our local representatives are but frankly um the candidates want to know they want to know who their colleague councillors might be uh the 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 councils would like to know what's the mix um yeah. are we going to get some you know yeah. um, a mix between re-elected councillors and new councillors, you know, that, you know, that feeds into how we do our induction training. Um, we just had the Queensland state election you, you, that evening. There was a TV show with the yeah. results coming through, wasn't it, on the board? Yeah. Um, we'll yeah. see that next next Saturday with the, with, with the US elections. In Australia, yeah. we'll be seeing yeah. the results feeding through within a matter of hours, probably not the outcome, in, but, in um, fact, in fact, Tony, on that, it'll be in competition because that'll be playing out on Wednesday, which is when we think all of these council <laughs> results will start to be published. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so I, look, I, I think, I think it's good to see that the VSC have acknowledged perhaps that they could have done better. That suggests to me that we're going to see 
uh, either a, a more, more information um, over the next week, but certainly um, next next election cycle, um, we, we might be a much more sort of informed um, sector in this regard. So uh, what do we want to know about? I, I think one example of why the VEC perhaps is concerned about results get, uh, get getting misconstrued is, is what happened with the Lord Mayor of the City of Melbourne very early in the week. Uh, strong tips that Anthony Koutafides would probably win, uh, depending on how preferences have flowed. But as the counting has progressed, it's become more and more clear that Nick Reese likely uh, will have the numbers to to maintain that office. Yeah, I, th I think I um, I might have said to you on the weekend, Chris, that that you know, um, it's. It was a bit premature for Team Cuda to come out and and say they're likely to win. If if the preferences had have flowed as per their how to vote card, they they would have they would have won. So what happened in that um, council? Remember is that Nick Reese um, uh, received um, twenty four point three five percent of the primary vote, um, the the most primary votes. Anthony Kudafidis came third on the primaries at thirteen point nine, but was tipped to, um, with no one with the majority, they're going to have to distribute uh, along preference lines. Um, and if everyone who voted for Cuda followed his how to vote card, he would be elected. But of course, that's not really what happens all the time. I don't know yeah, about you, Julie, but I, nah. um, I walk, when I vote, I know who I want to win the most. And they're my one, number one, they probably know who I want least to win and yeah. then I pick them yeah. as their the last number and then I work my way in, you know to yeah. the middle from Fill there the middle. and yeah. I don't necessarily follow um anyone's you know how to vote card strictly and that appears to be what's happening at the city of Melbourne I'd love to know how yeah. many people do follow a how to vote card but also in these perhaps the city of Melbourne's a little bit different perhaps the budgets of those campaigns allow more distribution of information but for the most part in a postal election how do how do people get how to vote cards in the first place uh, do you have to rely on them turning they, up in they, your letterbox they come in, yeah they come in your letterbox don't they yeah. most of them well, do i mean I, that's I, what I, happened I, with me but i just and i think some people will follow them if they are real devotee to that particular candidate then they will follow the letter of the law almost the one that they've got in their post box they might hang on to it and then put it aside and then when they vote they they just take it and refer to it Others, others will just, you know, will ignore it, chuck it in the bin, and then they'll just do random. I think most people will probably do random, as what Tony's saying. Uh, mm. They're not, um, you know, not not caught up on, you know, the, uh, you know, who's going to be second, third, and fourth, etc. So yeah, it's 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 going to yeah, be. It's, it's it's not a level playing field though, in that sense, is it? If you've got the money to distribute that to everybody's household, yeah. um, good luck to you. But a lot of candidates wouldn't. Um, no, I'm suggesting, uh, and where I live, uh, zero, total zero uh, wow. vote cards in in the mailbox. But I'm in a rural area, so yeah. So I just wondered, um, and and it doesn't surprise that um, predictions of of preferences are pretty impossible, basically, mm. as to how they're going to mm. flow. Um, what else? What do we want to know about? Um, I've I've uh, reported on a huge list on the the local government news roundup. This morning, there's a few metro results coming in. I think how the incumbents are doing, and I use that word loosely because, of course, technically there aren't any incumbents because they're all out of office. But yeah, uh, that's but, right. <laughs> but for for simplicity, um, yeah. sitting council is looking to be re-elected. Mixed bag in Port Phillip. Don't know if you've had a look there. Uh, it looks like the Greens' dominance might be on the way out. Yeah, yeah, there's a group there, residents of Port Phillip, um, which is kind of a, one of these alliance groups, and, and it looks like three of their four candidates are leading in their respective wards. Um, police, A police officer, Rod Hardy in Albert Park, Brian Mears at Lakeside, and Betty Jay in South Melbourne. I think Councillor Louise Crawford, who's in, who was a mayor at Port Phillip, has, she looks pretty strong, and I think she's she's yeah. been re-elected. But, yeah, we'll have a... We'll at least have a, a substantially different flavour in the council at Port Phillip, it would seem, with that um, um, alliance of independence. And that's a bit of a theme, Chris and Julie, this time yeah. around, that independence and, yeah. you know, often who have loosely aligned and campaigned together have, yeah. have, have done quite well.
I have to correct myself. I said greens in relation to Port Phillip. I actually meant was thinking greens in relation to Yarra. Yeah. It's um, yeah. Yarra where the I think they had five greens councillors in the last council. Mm. Uh, former Mayor Edward Crossland apparently is in a battle. Uh, Sophie Weed, uh, Sophie Wade's in a fight to retain uh, yeah. her spot. Independent Stephen Jolly has claimed victory in yes. his ward, and uh, you know there's some quiet whispers around for. Um, a, a higher profile leadership role, perhaps for Stephen Jolly in the new council. He's done it again. I mean, he's he's been a perennial councillor there. This, um, you know, uh, was it? He was the Socialist Alliance. I'm not sure if he's still running under that. But that Yarra for All banner, which was a sort of a group of mm. candidates who really seeking to replace that Green representation on council, I believe. Um, yeah, it seems that they've they've uh, they've done reasonably well. And certainly, it looks like um, Stephen Jolly, with um, nearly fifty four percent of the vote, um, looks yeah. like he's been re-elected. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. Um, what's happened at Burundara, Chris? There's been um, there's been a couple but, of potential changes at Burundara, I believe. A couple of bits coming through on uh, Burundara. The son of ex Premier Ted Bailey. That's Rob right. Bailey looks likely to to win a seat. I think incumbent uh, Deputy Felicity Sinfield is looking pretty strong mm. in her position there. I'm not sure if you, either of you have heard any more coming out of Burundara. Yeah, no, that's so, what I've heard. Yep. So Rob Bailey's um, leads this Voices of Kuyong, which is a you know an independent alliance big on climate change. He's seen as he, he was involved in Monique Ryan Steel campaign um at um at a federal level um so uh, again another group of community independents at least one there looks like being successful in rob bailey um i think victor franco is another independent looks like he's got up there yeah. in garden awards so again um well another you know a familiar name in politics in victoria another bailey um, mm -hmm. um looks mm -hmm. like um you know joining yeah. political circles yeah, a few and... um a few family connections with some of the people getting elected I have heard around uh, around the state. Julie, you were going to say something? Oh, I was just going to say I was uh, not surprised to see Jim Umedi down at Greater mm. Dandenong um, yeah. come back strong as ever. You know, been around forever. Really strong uh, support down in in his community there. So uh, pleased to see Jim coming back with a vengeance. Yep. A couple of other incumbents there look likely yep. to get back in, uh, Bob Milkovic and Philip yep. Dan. Ian Cook, who's been trying to get on the council yes. up to trying to get on, uh, get in at state government, is um, looking very unlikely to win a seat on the council there at uh, Dandenong. A couple of other incumbents uh, we can report on. Steve Abushi at Melton City Council yep. and Sophie Ramsey look like they will retain their positions. Mm. Megan Hopper mm. at Stonington, Sue Bolton at uh, Marybeck. Lambrinos Tapanos, the former mayor of Marybeck, uh, apparently with a fight on his hands there. Mm. Uh, Daria Callender and Diana Greamer, the, the only two incumbents at Hobson's Bay to restand, look uh, pretty likely to get back in. Daria Callender in particular. Uh, mm -hmm. Diana also projected to win her spot. Um, there's a, there's a, a, another good blog called localelections.com.au that I can recommend to you, which is under the Six News banner, which is publishing a whole heap of uh, information and counts that they're uh, getting hold of, which is worth bookmarking. Uh, that's where I saw Alida McKern performing strongly in Banyul and quite a few too close to call uh, vote uh, reports on that site as well. Yeah, Peter Castaldo, I think, in Banyul, um, also one of the Greens. It looks like he's he's got up as well, um, returning councillor. Even in the, we've got some from the regionals too, Chris and Julie. So it looks yeah, like have. in Bendigo, um, Karen, great in Greater Bendigo, Karen Core, who who sort of was one of the founders of that Golden Square Action Group. Um, looks like she's got up in Golden Square. Um, and um, Aaron Spong, another um, yeah. new candidate independent in Epilogue as well. Um, Greater Shepparton's an interesting one. Um, Shane Scarley, who's a really, um, you know, uh, out, outspoken, probably not the word, but well-known. High-profile. Mayor, high-profile yeah. mayor. Yeah. Um, uh, there has had a big win by the looks, more than 75% yeah. of the first mm. preference vote. Um, Very high. Compare that to the deputy mayor, Anthony Brophy, who thinks he's got a bit of a uh, 
fight on his hands at the moment with a challenge from uh, Terry Cowley. Trivia, trivia. I used, to, I went to school with Anthony Brophy and used to live around the corner from him. <laughs> well, it's not surprising you might uh, know a few candidates in Greater Shepparton. <laughs> there's, there's one that looks likely to win in Lower Goulburn Ward who's got the surname of Eddie. I shall say no more other than uh, <laughs> that is my old stomping ground. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, yeah. So, so it's it's the other one I I, I, I highlight is is Horsham, hmm. where yeah. I think that. Um, you know, of four of the councillors seeking re-election, we know there's been, you know, monitors and, and, and some issues yeah. in Horsham around conduct, but of those four councillors seeking re-election, at the moment, it just looks like Councillor Ian Ross is is the one who's got up. Um, you know, it's, it's early days, but it looks like um, some of those other councillors that are running, um, Claudia Hanel, David Bow, et cetera, might be in some trouble, at least on current counting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Danny Goss seems to have got up in Bore Bore as well. Um, so it seems that, you know, some of those sort of, um, use that word before today, outspoken, but some of those sort of independents who, are, who, who, who have been um, quite vocal uh, throughout this term seem to have done quite well um mm -hmm. but you know it's it's there there are some um some um ex exceptions to that too um a across the yeah. board as well where, where we've seen some of the you know candidates that are associated with political parties also do very well in very can we talk sport. about can we talk about um casey and whittlesey for a moment because of course yeah. they're coming back from administration uh, the only place i've seen reports on casey so far is on the local elections uh, blog. And when you look across all those wards, lots of candidates, and yeah. really it's nearly impossible to say who's going to win any of those wards except perhaps one where Stefan Kuhlman has got 44% of the vote. The rest of them are mm -hmm. really tight races, which tells you something about the interest in the return to uh, local democracy, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. And it, and it's a bit of a contrast because... Um, in Whittlesea, certainly in the ward that I vote in in Whittlesea, there are only two candidates. So right. it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a huge field. But, yeah, it seems Casey, Casey very well contested. I've seen yeah. nothing on Whittlesea yet. I'm, I'm, I'm keen to know what's happening in Wyndham. There's some interesting contests there. I haven't seen much reporting yet. Um, mm. It doesn't mean it's not out there. But as we said at the outset, we've got to be trolling for all of these from different sources. And, it, um, you know, at some point you just... You've got to give up and take a break. I'm getting square eyes, or <laughs> rectangular eyes from staring at my iPad. And maybe yeah. some good sort of general news yeah. on that election issue is that the turnout this time looks like at this stage it's likely to exceed the 2020 turnouts, you know, um, which was yeah. the, the figure was 81.5% um, in 2020 of, of, of um, eligible voters voted. Um, well, the latest figures I've got, the VEC say they've counted 77.4% of the envelopes that they distributed. Yep. So, you know, with more counting to go, looks like we could actually beat that 81.5% figure, which is a good, it suggests people are engaged and whether they're avoiding the $99 fine or they're yeah. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> keen to know who, who keen to influence who, who represents them at local council, I don't know, but we seem to have... Um, perhaps likely to do better than 2020. Well, again, yeah. and, and again, it's, you know, let's not let the facts get in the way of a good story. We had major news outlets last week reporting the 60% figure and saying, oh, this is going yes. to be you know, the lowest. Um, just not understanding that, you know, a lot of the votes are yet to even arrive, let alone be counted. That's right. So it suggests to me, Chris, because I saw that as well, and when yeah. you given me those figures now I've gone, gee, that doesn't align with what was said yeah. last week. But I think it's everybody's done that the last minute. Yeah. You know, that last minute surge to get your vote in. <laughs> yeah. Well, there were queues, exactly. weren't there? Um, yeah. In, mm -hmm. in some councils um, on Friday, I think some people didn't get in the door um, in time, you know, for wanting to, you know, vote in person on the very last day in the last few hours. Well, I think I think if they're in the queue, they were they were still going to be accommodated, yeah. even if uh, if the six o'clock bell had rung. Um, and I think a lot of that was exacerbated by the fact that uh, in some of those places, replacement balance was ballots were needed because of stolen trucks and That's post right. boxes and 
and all that sort of thing, which has uh, confused yeah. the issue a bit. At more least too. the post box boxes weren't burnt to the ground. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> like happened in, happening in the US. Ex exactly <laughs> right. Yes, I did see that too, uh, Julie. Yeah. All right. So, um, anything? Is there anything else to share? That's probably a good summary of what we know so far. Keep an eye. Up. So, mm -hmm. I recommend localelections.com.au. The Herald Sun's been doing some reporting. The Age has got a great blog. They call it the Slow Blog which is a not so <laughs> subtle dig at uh, the release of the information from uh, from the VLs, uh, VEC. Lots of the local papers around the state are doing uh, some great reporting on this as well. So find your local one if you're interested in uh, in somewhere in particular. We didn't mention Warrnambool, two former mayors there. Ah, uh, yes. Arnott and Vicky Jelly look like uh, they will mm -hmm. be uh, returned. Yeah. I haven't got a lot more information on Warrnambool. Yeah. Just, uh, yes. Sue Bolton in Marybeck too, I think. Uh, yes, uh, I mentioned Very well-known yes. council. Yeah. Yeah. We mention yeah. did we, yeah. Yeah. So, so prediction, guys, do you think there's going to be uh, sort of a low, medium or high amount of change, do you think, across across local government? Julie, what? it feels to me like there's going to be a lot of new faces. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, sounds like too. it's so far. So we'll we'll yeah. see where that prediction lands. But I think you're right. I think there's there's probably a sense from the community they're ready for change, I think. Yeah, and, and whether it's just the media picking up on the struggles that some of the incumbents are happening, mm. but there seem to be a lot of reports of incumbents struggling mm. to retain their their positions, yep. which which uh, feeds into my view um, that we'll have a lot of new faces. And, of course, with single-member mm -hmm. wards, um, it is, as some predicted, really changing the whole nature of, uh, of yeah. uh, these elections, I think, compared to past. And I do wonder whether or not that's linked to that whole, um, well, we saw that Age article recently about, you know, integrity yeah. being really high on um, on the list of important issues for the community and whether or not as a result of some of the integrity issues across local government, whether or not it's taken a bit of a hit and people yes. are saying time for change. Anyway, let's yeah. see. Let's see when we get the results. So we'll know a lot more next week. Yeah, so Wednesday the 7th of November, the other issue I'm hearing a bit of chatter about, I'm not going to repeat anything in particular, is what some of these likely results will mean mm. for some of the current CEOs at councils in the state. Some are predicting, yeah. uh, as has happened in other states, that we'll start to see some pretty heavy turnover coming, perhaps given uh, who some of the people getting elected from outside mm -hmm. uh, existing councillor groups and what their platforms have been. We've got six on the list now. Uh, Brett Luxford announced after we recorded yep. our episode last week that he was leaving Mitchell at the end of the year uh, to pursue new opportunities. So with John Baker last week at, at Mornington Peninsula, that brings the list to six. I'm aware of uh, two or three more that are mm. likely in the next few weeks. Yeah, mm. I agree, Chris. I think, yeah. I think yep. that's almost certain to be on the cards. Yep. Mm. yep, for sure. All right, so let's keep an eye on that. Uh, a couple of other stories before we head off to uh, to Reese's piece this week. Uh, the Geelong advertisers reported that there might be more strike action coming in Greater Geelong. They're at the pointy end of in, uh, negotiating a new EA. I think the last one um, expired a few months ago. There's a 3% offer on the table, uh, plus some one-off payments, which the, the union and their delegates are saying is is not enough. So uh, rubbish collection, parking fine collection, apparently um, potentially going to be affected in the coming weeks or months. Yeah. And it's just, it you know, it, it, it's unfair on the community that it affects. It's obviously, you know, um, you know, I suppose I'm a little bit biased in the sense that, you know, I've been an ex-CEO and I understand the struggle and the difficulties around balancing the budget. You know, I think the point that Greater Geelong made, which I think was really important, Chris, was that, you know, we're talking about 3%, which is over what the rate cap currently is at the moment. We still yet to see what the rate cap is going to be for next year, and that will come out around Christmas time. Um, but to me, 3% seems quite generous considering it's over the rate cap and considering that more than 50% of most council's budgets are spent on staff. Yeah. So that then means that there's going to be a you know potential big impact um, uh, across the board if the staff ask for more, uh, that uh, the only way that uh, a council can make savings is through reductions of services. 
um, and cutting, you know, cutting services to be able to meet the budget requirements because, you know, we can't, you know, in local government grow the budget more than the rate cap. So that's the challenge yeah. in now in this space. And it's just um, we're in a different space to what, we, what we've been before. We were before rate capping. It might have been a bit more palatable, but now it's not. And you say um, over fifty percent of councils' budgets yeah. going on staffing costs. For some, it's much more than that. For some, oh, it's yeah, in the mid sure. to high seventies. Yeah, yeah, uh, in right. fact, so yeah. it is a real challenge. Yeah, Tony, anything to add on that? Oh, well, well, certainly, um, a lot of CEOs will be watching this across Victoria, particularly, um, you know, in around Geelong, you know, Wyndham, Golden Plains, Surf Coast, there's 2,800 employees at Geelong. They won't all be captured by this EBA, but clearly, um, the, you know, what the, the rates that Geelong are paying um, are going to be very relevant to, uh, you know, councils in the vicinity that are in competition for those staff, if you like. So, um, yeah, a lot of people will be watching this this and uh, with yeah. interest um, and um, and seeing what implications it has for their own yeah. municipality. Yeah. And I think also, Chris, that, you know, what we forget to sort of factor in in all of this is councils are very, very good employers and they often provide other benefits to, to their staff, um, you know, professional development opportunities are, you know, really common, um, flexible working, et cetera, where that's possible, obviously. But, you know, it, it's they're a great employer of people and they care about people and so it's a great space to be. Uh, so don't underestimate that. Don't take that for granted. That's what I say. Uh, another statement from Stonington CEO Dale Dixon this week after the state government fast-tracked approval of a development in Glen Iris. This is uh, a, a six-storey building with a full-size Woolworth supermarket, bottle mm -hmm. shop, 83 apartments above. It apparently attracted a record number of community objections. The council rejected it. VCAT rejected it. The state government has now fast-tracked its approval and the council's pretty disappointed and concerned about the potential impacts on local infrastructure from this decision. Yeah, they are, Chris, and they're, they're, it's, it's interesting, this one, because... Again, a lot of councils will be watching these kind of decisions that are overturned by the minister now because uh, of the push towards that housing agenda. So how many more of these are we going to see? Now, there's going to be quite a bit of community outcry in relation to this, and this is not going to be the only one. There's going to be many of these coming forward. So uh, significant development for Glen Iris. Uh, the, the council seemed to think they had a strong position in relation to this one. VCAT supported it, as you said, and then the ministers overturned it. So how many of how many more of these are we going to see? I think there's going to be a lot more of these decisions that are going to be overturned by the state government to push their agenda for, for more housing. Tony, you've zoomed in. Is that to get our attention? Do you want to say something? Awesome. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's, um, <laughs> it's, it's reading my mind, this uh, camera. Um well, I think I think what we should say is that um, in the decision that Sonia Kilkenny, the planning minister, has made, there is um, some sort of uh, walk back from the original application um, provisions. Um, as you say, they sought the applicants sought six stories. What the ministers approved is five stories. Um, they were seeking eighty apartments. Um, Sixty apartments are approved. I think this, the supermarket, which I think is a Woolworths supermarket, it is, yeah. it was to have a bottle shop. That bottle shop's um, not part of what's been approved. But what struck me is that the planning minister's announcement, I thought, was really quite party political. I didn't, I didn't really like it. It was, we can't allow Liberal and Greens-led councils to block quality and affordable homes close to public transport and services. Hey, it's not about what political parties these people represent it's you know they're the elected councillors um i don't know why the minister has to signal out yeah <laughs> you know their, their their political affiliation but again yeah. statements made during an election period effectively when there aren't any yeah. councillors in place yet we don't know what the makeup of the new stonington council is going to be but anyway uh, good know. points on those changes tony i hadn't picked that up uh, i was going off the the uh, the original a version in the Stonington press release there. So thanks for mm, clarifying mm. that. But it's interesting, isn't it, that approach by the developer as well to go now to the minister. I mean, this has this has occurred across the board for, you know, for many years where developers will go running to the minister to try and get them to approve it. 
So um, it's going to be interesting. Now, this one's been very public and um, and it's as a re- result of a re- request from a developer. This is going to this is going to continue to happen, probably magnified, I expect. Uh, mm. so, uh, so I think we're going to get much more of this. Stay tuned. Well, well the yeah. Premier's come out this week, Julie, and said she's written an opinion piece for The Age, just in her yeah. album, and said, you know, um, um, Brighton, I want you to know I'm a I'm a I'm not a blocker, I'm a builder. You know, mm. your kids deserve a chance to live here. Um, we're not talking about high rises in every street, we're talking about townhouses and low rise units. I think she described it as gentle density, um, close to the stations. But you know, Jacinta Allen is seems to be very much staking her, you know, legacy on this housing. Mm. Or, you mm. know, it was the big build with with the former premier. Um, yeah. Jacinta Allen, it seems to be very much on this um, this mm. outcome around housing. Um, um, and um, there doesn't seem to be a, a backing off at, um, in terms of uh, local opposition. And she seems to have doubled down in this opinion mm. piece in the age. Yeah. Well, as, as you said, Tony, last week, that they've got a difficult job to do here. Mm. There's, you know, there's no doubt there's a housing crisis. We need to provide more housing and much more of it. It's it's how it's done and where the communities are part of uh, that solution, I guess, that uh, most councils would argue uh, needs to be given mm. more credence. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. agree with that. All, all right. Shall we pause for this week's segment with uh, Rhys Thomas? He's got some insights into the new uh, regulations and the, the code of conduct uh, framework that's just coming up. We'll come back and talk about a couple more quick stories before we wrap up shortly. Let's step over to VLGA Central now where Reese Thomas is waiting for us to respond to some feedback this week. Hello, Reese. Trick or treat, Chris. Hello. Indeed. Were you out trick or treating, were you, for Halloween? Uh, I was not, but I did have people at our front door. Oh, really? Okay. Where I live, thankfully, nobody comes to the front door. Uh, Well, very rarely, anyway, certainly not at Halloween. Um, Okay, today, we talked last week about the new regulations having been given royal assent. This is about the, the, uh, the governance and integrity reforms, and you promised to give us a bit more context this week. I did, Chris. And, you know, of course, I'm talking about the local government governance and integrity regulations, which were changed last week when they, um, or the week before, I should say, with the making of those amending regulations. But last week in a further development, um, uh, actually, just let me think, it was earlier this week on Wednesday, Mm. um, the local government Victoria released guidance material to the sector on those changes to the regulations. And that's kind of useful because it really puts some meat on the bones and provides a bit of assistance to all of us in the sector when we come to interpret the changes that have been made. So before I get into the detail of what those changes are and how they differ from what had been foreshadowed, I just wanted to commend Local Government Victoria for undertaking a consultation process that was, although constrained by time, it was clearly well-intentioned because they did listen and they did get pretty meaningful con- um, contributions from the sector, which was great. So um, we are pretty pleased that the VLGA, a lot of the feedback that we provided was taken on board and now is reflected in the guidance material. So that's good because the strength of these processes, it's really determined by the willingness of the decision maker to actually respond to the feedback, hence the name of my segment this week. And I've got to give local government Victoria full marks on that front. Okay. Excellent. All right, so... Uh, so let's, let's dive into the detail and um, anyone that's um, short of time can skip this segment if they like because it's also going to be available to VLGA members in an edition of Governance Insights, which we've um, which we've published to the sector earlier today. But Why, um, why, would, any, why would you encourage people to skip the segment, Reese? I'm sure that's just anathema to most well, of you. Well, maybe you can listen viewers. in and you can get it twice. Yeah, okay. So, um, look, the signature change brought about by the regulations is the Model Councillor Code of Conduct. And the final version that was regulated did differ from the draft version in a number of key ways. So some of the key differences were um, there's a requirement that hadn't been foreshadowed, but a requirement included that councillors respect the rulings of the mayor or the chair of a council meeting or delegated meeting. So so hopefully that's something that would mean that the need to eject a councillor from a meeting would be very rare indeed. So that's a good inclusion. Um, A more specific reference to sexual harassment and behaviour and sexualised behaviour. It's hard to see anyone having a complaint about that. Um, I think there's a pretty good change, uh, which is that the 
proposal that had been written to prohibit a councillor from misleading the public or misleading the council uh, has been tempered a little bit by the inclusion of the word intentionally. So intentionally misleading is now the provision. So it won't be a breach of the standards to make a mistake or misspeak or misunderstand an issue, which I think was something that a lot of people had concerns about. Um, there's a provision which hadn't been foreshadowed, which has now been included about a councillor not seeking favourable treatment for themselves, so not seeking to jump the queue with a planning application or seek preferential treatment in a service from council. Um, that's a good one. I've taken a close look at the wording of that because one of my concerns was that that might prevent a councillor from advocating on behalf of a member of the community because the provision extends to the councillor's associates. But I'm comfortable that the wording has been written in a way that it wouldn't prohibit that and then a council can still take up the case of one of their right. constituents and that makes yeah. sense yeah but there's there's two notable differences i think um, that would impact on what councils actually need to do to prepare so the first is the plan that i talked about last time to require each council to adopt a binding councillor social media policy and make a breach of that policy amount to misconduct that's been abandoned and that's not um, not unsurprising because there was significant concern in the sector that that proposal could have enabled councillors to essentially weaponise those social media policies to prohibit uh, public debate by councillors in a public forum online. Um, so instead, what the local government Victoria have done is inserted provisions in the model code regarding councillors spreading misinformation, which I talked about, or purporting to speak on behalf of the council. And there's some guidance about the application of those behavioural standards in the social media environment in that guidance material. So it's it's particularly useful because um, the, uh, the guidance material also provides some assistance for councillors in, in understanding when they're acting in the performance of their role and when they're acting in an entirely personal capacity. And I know we've often talked about where that line is. And there's some examples in that material that help illustrate that for councillors on Bruce, social media. I think that's given, useful. Given the use of social media has cropped up in almost every uh, conduct decision that we've looked at in uh, in recent years, I imagine there's two distinct schools of thought here. Some people are probably still disappointed that uh, this isn't in the new code because of those experiences. Yeah, I think that's right. But I think when people look closely at the environment, a lot of those people may be won over when they start to understand uh, what the new regime will, will be, because councils will still have the opportunity to adopt a councillor social media policy, and the VLGA will be very shortly releasing a model councillor social media policy for our members for their use. And that sets out not just the standards of conduct which apply on social media, things like the need to behave respectfully, the need to not discredit the council, not to undermine the mayor, not to purport to speak on behalf of council, all those factors, but also other legislative environment um, considerations which councillors should be aware of, issues around defamation, copyright, release of confidential information, um, release of personal or health information of individuals, all of those things will be covered in our model policy. And I think okay. when you look at that in totality, you realise that um, there is a, there fairly reasonable guardrails will be in place around councillor social media use without stifling their right to public debate and use that as a as part of that. Yeah. I look forward to that model being released. I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about it when that happens. The other one I've heard people talk about, Reese, is the confidentiality policy. People thought there'd be something in there as well. Yeah, and again, that policy also has been abandoned, and I suspect for the same reason. I suspect the, the way it had been drafted would essentially have allowed councils to create a policy to prohibit councillors from releasing information which um, they determined to be um, an in-house or internal document, even though it doesn't satisfy the criteria of being a confidential document under the Act. So um, that's been changed. There's some new provisions around um, uh, prohibiting councillors from making council information available where the public, in, the public availability of that information would be contrary to the public interest. So that's language you might have heard before. It's from the public transparency principles in the Act. 
and there's some guidance about that, and it will allow councils to adopt a policy around that space, but not to in introduce new standards of conduct beyond what is in the model code of conduct. And we'll, again, the VLGA will have um, some guidance for our members on that, and we'll be publishing um, some provisions which councils might choose to either adopt as a standalone policy or insert in their public transparency policy. Okay. Before we let you go, what about the mandatory training? More uh, insights on that? Yeah, look, the guidance material probably explains that best, and that's the place to go and look. Um, there's some uh, the dot points, the main headline issues that needed to be covered haven't changed from what had been foreshadowed, but there's now some guidance material that unpacks that a little bit and provides some context. Um, so councils would be well advised to match that table with what their um, with what their plans are for induction. We've done that with our own offering that an, um, many councils across Victoria have taken up and confirmed that all the mandatory obligations are met. Um, and any council that has gaps to fill or wants us to work with them to develop induction just need to reach out to us. Okay. So uh, what what's ahead for next week? Well, it's a short week, so um, I probably won't get quite as much time, but I've got um, some interesting facts. No doubt many of us will be taking a break from the uh, the refreshing the VEC website constantly and hoping that the data will be available. Um, to watch the results come out of the US on Wednesday because yeah. those election watchers will be focused on that. And I've got an interesting bit of trivia on that, which is that uh, the election obviously next week is on Melbourne Cup Day. But uh, I'm not sure if you knew, but the President Trump, when he was elected the first time, was not elected on Melbourne Cup Day because although Melbourne Cup Day in Australia falls on the first Tuesday of November, the US presidential election falls on the Tuesday, the first Tuesday after the 1st of November. So uh, they don't always align. They, they, there's right. a reason for it. It's a good story yeah. relating to church, the day the market was on and Halloween, believe it or not. Oh, okay. Anyway, every 28 years or so, the the uh, Melbourne Cup Day and uh, presidential election fall out of sync and it did uh, for President Trump. But I'll be back next week nonetheless and I want to share what I think is a pretty big loophole in the Local Government Act. Yes. Um, all will be revealed next week, but there's a message for Victorian CEOs in the meantime, which is please don't die. And I'll explain <laughs> why next week. Okay. That's rather, well, maybe it's not that random. Uh, I'm publishing an interview this weekend with uh, John Baker at uh, Mornington Peninsula Shire Reese, and you'll be interested in his thoughts on what would have happened if his uh, resignation uh, fell a couple of days later than it did when there were no councillors or mayor to resign to. I Think about that one. Goes direct to the issue I'll be talking about. <laughs> ah, there you go. All right. We'll look forward to that next week. Thanks, Reese. Insightful as always. Have a great unofficial long weekend. Thanks, Chris. Always good to hear from Reese Thomas. And as he said, something interesting coming up uh, next week. Uh, as I mentioned to him, I've been chatting to uh, John Baker, the CEO of Mornington Peninsula, who's heading up to the Sunshine Coast. Tony and Julie, uh, John's a salary package is making news up there, oh. as, you, as you might expect. It's in it's in the press. Um, I spoke to John about that for an interview that's dropping this weekend. I used a piece of it in the in the local government news roundup uh, this morning. He's he's remarkably sanguine about that and uh, very open about uh, you know CEO salaries being public public information. So um, I thought it was an interesting take and there's an interesting take on a heap of other stuff in that interview too. So if you have a time, mm. if you have a chance, have a listen on the weekend. Yeah, we hope they don't release out presenter salaries. That would be that would be LGA, but you know that would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? Oh <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, Townsville's mayor, Troy Thompson, might have been hoping for a change of government that uh, it might have taken the pressure of him, it doesn't appear to be the case. The new Premier, David Crisofuli, is reported to have taken Crown advice uh, this week on that whole show cause notice, um, and he's yet to, to reveal what he's going to do. But he is on the record prior to the election as saying that uh, Mr Thompson's position there at Townsville is uh, untenable. Uh, so we still wait for a decision on what happens there while that uh, Crime and Corruption Commission case uh, continues on and you know every day there's a new story about this thing it's mm. uh it's got to be a huge distraction for the council there at townsville and the people and i i haven't seen mayor troy thompson's response to that show cause notice but i read that it 
was 23 pages long. Mm. So there's quite a bit in it. Um, you know, um, it, it and he's, 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 he's appealed to the, the newly elected Premier saying, you know, um, give him a, a real crack at his job, please. Um, mm. um, we remember we we reported, I think last year even it might have been those Americans call it false fella. You know those claims of mm. having been, you know, have some connection to the defence forces that mm. uh, that were were a bit um, somewhat questioned in a very, as I said at the time, a very defence forced focused town townsville with a lot of army and air force bases up there um said there'd be a strong community reaction well he's hung on so far troy but um yeah i think the clock's ticking mm, sounds yes. like mm. <laughs> all right so keep keeping there on the local government news roundup we'll keep reporting on that as there are new developments a couple of follow-up notes from last week someone picked me up on the pronunciation of chippenham town council i said chippenham Oh, okay. you've got you got to go. get it so right. I should have known that. I, I was going to say, that. Julie, you let you let me down there. I'm that's, sorry, Chris Eddie. That's I'm the sorry. council. That's the council that's leaving or has left X, formerly known as Twitter. And I picked up this week. Uh, I actually saw it on Twitter uh, that I think PTV has dropped its accounts from X, and and I'm Ooh. wondering whether other government departments in. Uh, in Victoria and Australia yeah. are following suit. So it does feel well, it's like not, it's yeah, days it's not, are numbered. It's not a good rap, has it, mm. at the moment? So no. anyway, yeah. I think he's been anyway, sued apparently, at the apparently what's hot now is um uh not uh or not not Twitter, not X, yeah. <laughs> whatever we want to call it, not Facebook. That's not hot anymore. No. Uh we're moving away from that. Snapchat was really popular and particularly with the young people. Uh and now it's TikTok. So mm. it's TikTok for, you know, if you want to be in the uh, in the modern world, guys, we'll have to. Have you got, uh, have you got TikTok that. on your phone, Tony? No, no, no. I haven't. I, Are I you on TikTok, you Julie? Dance or something to be on TikTok. <laughs> or something like that, don't you? I'm no, not on no, TikTok, no. and I've no, never no, been on Snapchat. Yeah. So uh, I'll wait no. and see if it's if it's something that's going to hang around before I before I bother. Yes, they tell me Facebook is for your grandparents these days. It is. Yes, yes. <laughs> Ask any young person, and they'll say that you know. They've left Facebook in droves. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, anything else to share before we wrap up? Because I think we've reached the conclusion by the sounds of things. <laughs> I just want yeah. someone to write me a letter in copper plate and um, I'll <laughs> show that to you, Chris, and you'll be happy. <laughs> All right. Keep those tips coming in on election results. We'll round up a few more next week when we get back together here on uh, TGU. Julie, Tony, thank you as always. Have a great week and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I'm heading up to sunny bright this weekend, so nice. uh, it'll be beautiful up there, no doubt, and uh, catching maybe the Melbourne Cup on the way back. But a uh, uh, big shout out to that beautiful part of the world up there, Alpine uh, Shire. Lovely. Enjoy the unofficial long weekend, uh, both of you. We'll see you next week. That's uh, TGU for this week from VLGA Connect, sponsored by Hunt & Hunt Lawyers. Thank you for watching and listening, and we'll see you next time. 